want to bring you to Mark's Gospel in chapter 1, please. Mark's Gospel in chapter 1. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and reading from verse 21. Mark 1, 21, and they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was a there in there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread ab abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. We'll end there, and we're trusting the Lord uh, to bless the reading of his inspired truth. There's little doubt that demonic activity increased during our Lord's earthly ministry, simply showing us satanic opposition to Christ. And there will always be, that will always be the case, that when God is at work, you can be absolutely sure the devil will be at work also opposing that work. And as we draw nearer to the end of the age, it is clear from Scripture that Again, demonic activity will increase. When you read in the book of Revelation of demons tormenting men. But I do believe the demonic activity will manifest itself, of course, in the man of sin, the devil's Messiah, the Antichrist that is to come. And he will accept what our Lord Jesus Christ refused. You remember in the temptations that the Satan offered to the Lord Jesus the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. It was a kind of shortcut to the kingdom. But of course our Lord would have none of it. But there is one coming who will indeed receive, will accept that offer from the devil. If you want to come over with me just for a few moments to the book of Revelation in chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And of course, in Revelation 13, we read of the rising of this beast out of the sea. And I know you've been looking at some of these things in recent times. But if you look at this particular chapter here, you have this, what we believe to be the revived Roman Empire rising up, spoken of in the book of Daniel. And here we have it spoken of as a beast. And this, what you need to realize when you're looking at the Revelation and looking at these scriptures that the beast refers not only to the revived Roman Empire, but also refers to the emperor, if you like, the Antichrist himself. And you need to bear that in mind when you're reading these verses. But I want you to notice in verse number 2 of Revelation 13, we're told where his power will come from, and authority will come from, the Antichrist, and indeed this revived Roman Empire. At the end of verse 2, it says, the dragon, and that's of course the devil, we can see that clearly from chapter 12, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And as we think of the revived Roman Empire that the Bible speaks of that will be at the end of the age, and as we think of the man of sin, the Antichrist that will rise up, his power and his seat and his great authority will come from the devil himself. He will be given, I believe, what the Lord Jesus was offered, but of course refused. We read, of course, in the next verse of, a, of a, a counterfeit, what I believe is a counterfeit resurrection. He's the great counterfeiter of the things of God. He wants to be like the Most High. And in verse 3, we see that one of his uh, heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. What I want you to see, though, is in verse 4, 
what it says. And they worship the dragon, that's the devil, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The world that would not bow the knee to Jesus Christ will bow the knee to Satan's Messiah, will bow the knee to the Antichrist that is to come. There's no doubt, dear friends, uh, that this uh, evil that we see, this demonic influence and power will be used indeed to bring about this, these things that are spoken of in the book of Revelation. There will be an unholy trinity at work. There is little doubt in my mind that we're getting little glimpses of what is to come in the tribulation time. Little glimpses. We see distress of the nations. Our Lord Jesus speaking about the end of the age, and we believe the tribulation time. The Lord spoke about distress of the nations with perplexity. That means there's no answer. Nations have no answer to, to, to things. And, the, and he speaks also of the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts filling them, uh, looking uh, for those things which are coming uh, upon the earth. What a terrible time is ahead in that time of tribulation, but we're thankful this morning, dear friends, we believe the Lord's coming for His own. Amen. He's coming to the air. We're not looking for these things. We know they're coming, but we're not looking for these things. What amazing times we're living in. For 2,000 years there was no Israel. They were dead nationally. As Ezekiel 37 clearly tells us, they were dead bones, dry bones in the valley of the nations. But of course, God said in that chapter that He would bring them back into the land. He would make them a nation again. Israel has to be in the land for final events. Dear friends, Israel's in the land. They're a nation today. What for? Because Christ is coming. And final events that are set forth in the Scripture, they have to take place. What terrible things are coming? We're getting little glimpses of it. The violence, the terrible bloodthirsty violence that are, that's happening. And we know what's coming, even as we think of the Lord's words, the sea and the waves roaring. As we read in the book of Romans, creation groaning and travailing. I was up in a town center the other day, and there was, uh, there was a whole crowd protesting. There were children from a school, obviously, young people, I suppose. Uh, they were protesting about climate change and global warming, and, and obviously their teachers were with them, and, and they were going about with little, placa with little boards wanting you to sign a petition, and a young girl came up to me and she said, asked me if I would sign a petition about this terrible problem of global warming and our carbon footprint and so on. And I said, no, I'm afraid I wouldn't sign it. I said to her, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator and sustainer of all things. Now, I didn't get much more to say to her because she didn't want to stay and talk to me any further. But if I had have had the chance, I would have said to her, don't you worry about your carbon footprint. You worry about your sin. Because what's coming upon this old world is because of sin. It's not because of any carbon footprint or anything like it. <coughs> the Lord Jesus Christ is in control. These things are in his hands. Our Lord cast out many demons and devils. Even on that day, it seems that he dealt with this man in the synagogue. If you look at verse 34 of chapter 1 of Mark, it tells us there, and he healed many that were sick of divers diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Clearly, we see the power of the Lord over evil. Now, friends, we know what's coming in this old world. We know the demons are at work, but we have nothing to fear because he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And how we have that confidence in Christ. I want you to see, first of all, the observance. The observance. Here we find our Lord teaching in the synagogue on the Jewish Sabbath. This was his practice, it seems, to come to the synagogue observing the Jewish Sabbath, not being tied to the traditions of men and the many heavy burdens that the scribes and others had laid upon the people, but coming to the place of worship and prayer. I want you to notice a word here, and it is straightway, straightway, which indicates to us its importance, its importance. And so it is for us, dear friends, as we gather we gather on the Lord's Day.
appropriate way would encourage us as to its importance that we're here. But also it would encourage us as to his promptness. Straightway. And I know we can be overtaken by circumstances, whereas the Lord cannot. I know we can be running late at times, and we find it hard, maybe uh, when so many things are happening with us, and uh, there's many things that can delay us, but we should always make the effort to come straightway, and perhaps to be in time, because the Lord is here. The emphasis in the synagogue was not only of worship and prayer, but Scripture reading and teaching. And this provided an opportunity for the Lord uh, to read the Scripture and to speak. Uh, and the Apostle Paul, of course, in the synagogue, often took that same opportunity. Wherever he went, even in Gentile world, he, he sought out Jews, first of all, in the synagogue to go, and that he might read a Scripture and he might begin to preach Christ unto them. How important it is as we think of the reading of Scripture and the teaching of Scripture. I'm sure many others would prefer miracles, but you know how important, how vital it is teaching sound things. So important it is. You know, the Apostle Paul exhorted Timothy in this regard as to sound teaching. He was to hold fast to the form of sound words. Chapter 1, he tells us that. And he was to keep that good thing which was committed to him. Uh, by, by, uh, by the Holy Ghost. And, and he was not only to keep it, but in chapter 2 of Second Timothy, he's told that he, he's to, uh, to pass it on to faithful men, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is so vital. Sound biblical teaching is what is required in these days. Sadly, we look around us today, and it seems the emphasis has changed in so many places. I've gone to places and the pulpits disappeared and they've now got a stage and they've got lighting and, and it's all about performance and it's not about the teaching of the Word of God. Oh, dear friends, oh, that we might realize the importance of sound biblical teaching, the expounding of the Word of God. That's what will make the difference. You see, the word sound is used here by the Apostle Paul, which indicates it's conducive to health. It's sound. And when you have biblical teaching, it is conducive to spiritual health. And that's what's so badly required in these days in which we live. There's a wonderful verse, of course, in this chapter, verse 15 of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, where it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Approved unto God. Surely that should be our ambition we may seek the approval of others for whatever reason, but dear friends, let us always be careful to be seeking God's approval. What we discover is that the people were amazed and astonished here in chapter 1 of Mark in verse 22, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. It seems they understood what he was teaching. It was understandable. <coughs> it was heart-searching. They realized this, and truly, the reality was, did they really receive it? Yes, they realized it was different. It was heart-searching. Did they just admire it, or did they receive it? You see, there's a difference. Because although it was obvious what Christ preached was truth, they, they would so easily turn away from it. You know, there are churches that hear a preacher and they recognize the authority that he has, and they tell the preacher he's just what they need. And this has happened on many occasions. I've heard it over the years. And he's just the teacher that they need. They need some good biblical teaching. But when he begins to preach the Word of God, and he begins to sound forth that truth, they didn't really want to hear it at the end of the day. It was too much for them. And this was the experience of our Lord. This is what we find with our Lord as well. Just come with me for a moment to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, just for a moment. And in Luke chapter 4, and in verse 22, we read there, and it says, And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? They were amazed at his teaching. But then you come down to verse 28. 
And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him into the brow of a hill whereon, the, uh, their, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. They were astonished. They'd never heard anything like it. And then, of course, as the Lord continued to teach, they didn't want to hear it. There's so many that want to admire, but they don't want to receive what the Word of God actually teaches. Christ's teaching had authority, not as the scribes. There was an authority. There was a power. Christ spoke with complete confidence. There was no hesitation, no doubt. You see, probably the scribes were not so confident when they handled the Word of God. Like many across Christendom today, it's popular not to be dogmatic about anything. It's popular not to be dogmatic or, or to be outspoken about anything that the Bible says. We have the church leaders today coming together, setting aside the Word of God, and they cite uh, Christian love. This is what they say. This is more important. What a, what a tragedy. What a day we're living in. We see the observance. He came to the synagogue on the Jewish Sabbath. And then we see the disturbance. Notice the disturbance. In the midst of the synagogue, a man cried out. We don't know if this was while the Lord was speaking or as he had finished but it clearly was a reaction to Christ. Scriptures tell us he was possessed with an unclean spirit, a demon. Unclean simply indicates the immoral influence upon this man. We should not be surprised at the presence of this individual and this unclean spirit in the synagogue. It is a solemn warning to all assemblies of God's people. The powers of darkness desire to get in among the people of God, to mar the work of God, to oppose the work of God. This man's presence was there to oppose Christ and his teaching. And so it is today. There are other spirits at work, not the Holy Spirit. And such uncleanness has come in often among the people of God. Opposition to sound teaching will always come from the powers of darkness. When the preacher is not a compromiser of the truth and he preaches the whole counsel of God, you know, there'll always be a reaction. Always mark where it comes from. It's so vitally important. The original words for cried out here indicates a scream. A scream. I would imagine this was a frightening thing when this, this possessed man screamed screamed. A frightening experience, a loud disturbance. What we see is a lack of reverence for the place, but of course, for the presence of the Lord. And friends, we must have that respect and that reverence for the place where the saints gather, because the Lord is in the midst. That includes members' meetings. I must say, I must say, as I look back over the 30 years I was involved in pastoral ministry, just reminded this morning by a brother here that 24 years ago I married him and I didn't realize at the door there. That's happened to me before. I, I did so many weddings when I was up in Coke that uh, I hardly remember some of them, to be quite honest. And, uh, but I look back to those, uh, those days, those early days in ministry, and I remember in that first church that I was in, I, at the members' meetings, I could hardly get a word out of anybody. And it was only later in my ministry that I, I, did, I realized that was, that was great. <laughs> Those were good meetings uh, whenever there was not a word. But uh, I look back to those early years, and I have memories of members' meetings which were indeed reasonably good. And I'm glad to say in my final years in pa pastoral ministry, again, I had a good experience. But I have to say in between, I've had some bad experiences some bad experiences. And to me, clearly, there was a spirit at work which was not the Holy Spirit. And that's very sad. There were some who decided they wanted to speak their mind, some being loud and disruptive. Indeed, I had an experience where I wasn't the chairman, but somebody was, who was chairman was told to shut up in the midst of the meeting. And you know, friends, that's a carnal spirit, perhaps, if it's, if it's no more. It's dreadful to think of the things that have happened among, in the midst of the people of God and how we need to be conscious of the presence of the Lord as we gather. That is so vitally important. 
The words of the demon are spoken by the man. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Which indicates that he wanted nothing to do with Christ. And this is sadly the attitude of the ungodly. The attitude of the ungodly. They will accuse the godly of trying to destroy. I want you to notice that. You see that in verse 24. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The truth of God's Word is often portrayed as destructive and evil. You notice that in these days in particular. You notice that rugby player, Australian rugby player, in the last number of weeks, he, he uh, was outspoken about who was going to hell. And he listed a lot of folk who he believed would be going to hell, and he quoted from Scripture in the midst of it as well. And he said to be a believer, I don't know anything about him, but the reaction of, of the world, of the, uh, out in the world has been, been uh, amazing. And of course, he was suspended, and he was under investigation, and, and even anybody who sympathized with what he said, because he warned about hell, he found himself in trouble. The truth of God's Word is portrayed as destructive and evil. True believers today who refuse to bow down to the perversion of marriage, who refuse to support the killing of the unborn, the destroying of life are portrayed as evil and unloving. Isn't that right? That's the way it's portrayed. And how things are turned on their heads in this evil, Christ-hating world that we live in. It was interesting to see what happened in America when the Trump government endeavored to get a conservative judge to the Supreme Court. It was a judge who was a conservative, a judge who was pro-life against abortion, a judge who had family values, principles, it seems. I don't believe he was a, a believer, but, but he was someone who, in the eyes of those who uh, were the opposition, he was a threat to their ability to carry out abortions freely in America, that he might sway the balance the other way. And I don't know whether any of you saw some of the scenes that there were at even the congressional hearing that there was, and how that they accused him of all kinds of crimes, including rape. I mean, they were determined that he was not to get in. And even at the very hearings, there were women crying, screeching out. And you know what? As I read this particular scripture here, and I was looking at this scripture, it reminded me of that scene, that screeching out. Isn't it dreadful to think what kind of spirits would be behind this, those that want to kill the unborn, so determined to kill the unborn? What a tragedy. What a day we live in. What a terrible day. I want you to see the consequence here. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The demon knew Christ and confessed him to be the Holy One of God. He knew who he was. Demons know Christ. They had rebelled with Lucifer. Angelic beings had joined with Satan. Revelation 12 would indicate to us that perhaps the third part of the heavenly host, the stars of heaven, came down with Lucifer. These are the unclean spirits. These are the principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. The, the spiritual wickedness are wicked spirits in high places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the Apostle Paul tells us. Sadly, many people have, like the demons, have a knowledge of Christ, but they've never bowed the knee and they've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. This scream of the demon would remind us of the cry of the lost, facing hell without any hope because there's no salvation for demons. They know what awaits them. The pit of hell waits them. Indeed, hell was created for the devil and his angels. And dear friend, this morning I want to tell you, if you don't come to Christ and don't leave your sin, you'll find yourself in that place called hell, that place that was created for the devil and his angels. The most miserable place surely in all the world is to be in a place where there's no hope. And that's where these demons are. What a tragedy. I believe there will be those who know the gospel, 
those maybe even brought up in the gospel when they find themselves in the aftermath of the rapture when the Lord has come for his own, they'll find themselves in a place where there's nothing but strong delusions. That's what the Scripture tells us. Because they have held the truth in unrighteousness, because they have failed to be in time, as the old hymn says, while the voice of Jesus calls you, be in time. But for this man, there was a transformation. What an amazing transformation. He had been dominated by this unclean spirit, but all of a sudden he was set free. Christ rebukes the demon. This was the rebuke of evil. Evil needs to be rebuked. The gospel that we preach, dear friends, requires that we confront sin, that we preach against sin, <coughs> that we spell out the consequences of sin. When it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Sin destroys lives. It's so vitally important that we preach the gospel in this way. The gospel will be rendered powerless if evil is not confronted and condemned. We live in an age where there's many, will not even mention hell, there's many preachers who tell us that they're into, into a, a befriending ministry, where they leave out all the, uh, the bits that might offend, and they try to win people and so on. This is the kind of nonsense that we hear. A message without such an emphasis will never bring about repentance. Not only that, but when the clear teaching of Scripture is watered down to avoid upsetting people, when judgment is neglected, what happens is it creates a mixed multitude, and that's what you end up with. That's what you end up with. In many places today, there's but a mixed multitude. I want you to see the response here. Hold thy peace. From the original, it's be muzzled or be quiet. This response is believed to be Christ's reaction to the witness of the demon. The Lord would not accept the witness of a demon, would not accept the testimony of such evil. Friends, always remember this. The character of the testimony is vitally important. Over the years, there's been a trend in many places if someone is prominent in society, if they're known in the media, if they're in the entertainment world or in the music industry or whatever, but they're well known for whatever reason and they profess to be Christian, sometimes there's a clamor to get them to come and testify. Sometimes they imagine that somehow that their fame will somehow do a great work for, for God. But I want to tell you, friends, it's not fame that is needed. It's faith. It's faith. And how vitally important it is. Something I've discovered over the years, and something I've thought about a lot, that sadly, very often, those who are so-called celebrities in this world, those who uh, claim to belong to Jesus Christ, very often they're not taught in the Scriptures and very often they're very vulnerable, very vulnerable. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Looking back a long time ago, I remember I went into a Bible shop. It used to be down at the bottom of the Castlereagh Road in Belfast. I think I was saved just a few years, and I would spend a lot of my time going in and out of the Bible shops uh, to see what I could discover because I was endeavoring to get into the Word. But I noticed there was a, t a recording of a, someone's testimony. I can't remember. I don't believe I bought this, but I think at that stage you must have been able to rent this. It must have been. I can't really remember but the exact circumstances. But this individual was a footballer, and he was a Spurs footballer, and he professed to be saved or be a Christian, and this testimony was there. So I thought, I, I must have a listen to that. Because from a young lad, I supported Spurs. And I look back, I suppose Danny Blanchflower and uh, Jimmy Greaves then and other time, uh, those players were, were the ones I remember of my childhood. And I supported Spurs over the years. And this, this, this chap was supposed to be a Christian, and this was his testimony. So I took this recording and I took it home and I listened to it. And I was a bit confused because he talked about going to a Pentecostal meeting and he talked about having strange feelings. But at the end of the testimony, I didn't hear much more, much else. And you know, 
as time went on and even a few years went by, it became clear this individual was not a Christian. It was quite clear, not a Christian. Indeed, his beliefs were more akin to Hinduism than anything else. All kinds of bizarre notions that he had which came out in public at a later time. And you know, dear friends, how careful we need to be about testimony and the character of the testimony is so vitally important. The Lord said, come out of him. Come out of him. This command of Christ caused the demon uh, to the man to be torn, it seems. One last convulsion or seizure which threw the man on the ground in the midst. Evil doesn't give up easily. When a cleansing work is being done, you can be sure there'll be a reaction, there'll be a storm. That's why at times people are not prepared uh, to deal with things because they fear a reaction. They fear a reaction. Often evil is portrayed as as something uh, that brings happiness. Isn't that right? That's the world that we live in. You get the advertisements for the drink. You get the advertisements for gambling. And you know, uh, they're speaking about how this is, how wonderful this is, and you'll have a great time. And you know, what a, what a lot of lies. Anybody who's been in the job that John and I have been in, and you've been uh, dealing with situations on a Friday and Saturday night, and dealing with people and, uh, and going to the hospitals and, and seeing the scenes that, that all these things bring about. Terrible tragedy. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I want you to see the deliverance here. He came out of him. And friends, only Jesus Christ can so deliver from evil. There's no other Savior. Sadly, society today cries out like the demon, what have we to do with thee? Society today, people today don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. Don't want anything to do with him. It's like Tony Blair's government when they came into power in the late 1990s. They clearly said this, we don't do God. That's what they said. And as you look back to that, that Labour government under Tony Blair, they did everything to remove anything that was connected to God or the Word of God. They endeavored to remove it wherever they possibly could. They don't do God. That's what they said. That's the state of things today. Luke tells us that this man was not hurt at this stage. Luke, being a physician, mentions this in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. But it was clear evidence here that the man was possessed and that the Lord had delivered him. And they were all amazed, the Scripture, the scripture says. They were dumbfounded. This miracle was something that they'd never seen before. Yet every time, dear friends, someone is saved and born again, it's a wonderful miracle, a wonderful miracle. The word might indicate here, uh, amazed, that it also terrified them. There was a fear involved here in the original word. They witnessed a power that they'd never seen before, a power that was able to deal with the powers of darkness. What thing is this, they said? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. His fame, it says, spread throughout the land. Dear friends, oh, that we might spread the fame of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is able to save. Oh, this morning I trust that you're saved, because, friend, time is running out. We live in days, the Lord's coming, and I fear for so many who know the gospel you know you're going to find there'll be those who will delay and delay. They'll procrastinate until it'll be too late. And they will seek to enter in, as the Scripture tells us, but they will not be able. Oh, that you might come, if you're not saved, come to the Lord Jesus Christ even today. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for all that we can glean from it. We pray that Thou wilt bless it to our hearts today. Lord, that we might in these days have that reverence knowing that Thou art in the midst. We thank Thee that Thou art able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by Thee. We just pray that Thou wilt bless every heart, undertake for needs, as we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen.